If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Yo, man. In this episode of Mind Pump, for the first 45 minutes, Adam, Justin, and myself have fun conversation and we talk about some current events. We start off by talking about Organifi and the tainted supplements. Don't confuse that with the episode. You're adding heavy metal, not the cool kind. Yeah, they're not. Other people are. Well, yeah. Don't confuse that. No, 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 no. Not Organifi. Yeah. Don't confuse that with taint. Uh, We talk about Adam's outfit. He is looking fresh and fly. <laughs> I'm bringing fly for a white Taking guy. Taking it back to 96. 96, baby. <laughs> we talk about the challenges of divorce. Mm. Breaking my balls. Uh, we talk about the race for self-driving cars. And then we talk about the central nervous system and its role in inflammation. Uh, we mentioned Health IQ in all of that. Now, Health IQ is one of our sponsors. They do have life insurance. You can go to healthiq.com forward slash mind pump, take a test to see what kind of rates you qualify for. We also talk about Organifi, of course. There was this huge study that came out that tested protein powders and found many of them were tainted with heavy metals. Organifi, not one of them. Again, they are one of our sponsors. You can go to organifyshop.com, enter the code mind pump, get a discount. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, uh, should seniors with decent health be doing lifts like deadlifts, barbell squats, bench presses, and overhead presses, or should they focus on more functional exercises? Bingo. Don't get it, Granny. Exactly. Next question was, how to deadlift for beginners? Sounds like a manual, but we break it down. If you're a beginner, you want to learn how to deadlift properly, this is the episode for you. Some good Ooh. tips here. The next question was, what exactly do we mean when we talk about priming your central nervous system? This individual is trying to understand how our program maps Prime works. Is it science or is it all hubbub? The final question question was, what is the best way to train grip strength for all around activities and lifts? Is there any merit to the various grip training devices that are geared towards rock climbers? The tug method. And OCR athletes. Now, we do in this episode talk quite a bit about Prime and Prime Pro. Now, this month, if you get the Prime bundle, which includes Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro, or any other bundle, you will get access. To, <laughs> <laughs> you almost lost it again. You will get access. Did not to our forum <laughs> for free. So you'll get free access to our forum for enrolling in any bundle. If Adam's puberty. <laughs> causing you to laugh, we think you should visit mindpumpmedia.com and enroll in one of those bundles to get free access to our forum. Do it now. Organifi. Wow. Nee, 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 nee. <laughs> I like how you do the guitar Can we do thing. that as a commercial? That'd be awesome. I, I don't know. Can, can we? Can you get back to it? We'll just make... Yeah. Uh, can you do it on... Dude, do you know how... Organifi. That's very churchy. I know. Dude, I, know. <laughs> I actually took that from... Uh, I think it was like... The Creed? A, oh, Jesus or oh... You no, know, I... No, it was that one. I um, should have never opened Pandora's box. You guys are always like, oh, it's, not like a Mike, <laughs> it's like a Michael W. Smith kind of a, a jam. So just really. so, because you guys I, know I I've been exploring religions, right? Okay. So just so you know, I'm going to be Satanism is coming up next. So okay. I want you guys to be cool with that. <laughs> 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 I already like his music. Cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I figure it might be an easy one. to. <laughs> it is a lot cooler, I'll be honest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know how happy I am that, that Organifi responded to us so quickly and- I know you are. You were talking about the about, testing. You were stressing out about that hard. Yeah, that their qual- that their supplements are clean and. Dude, I appreciate them even more now. Yeah, man. Because I every time I see a report come back, like the one from uh, what was a Clean Label Project. Mm-hmm. Every time I see one of those reports come back from you know different organization, different third party organizations. There's several of them now I've seen where they test supplements and it's like. You know, nine out of ten supplements don't have what they say they have, or you know, eight out of ten protein powders have heavy metals. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> that's not even a minority. That's <laughs> almost like, oh, yeah, the majority. Dude, uh, you know what happens to me is I, I start trust anything. I start if you guys, yeah, but you know what? That's how. That's also how they. There's, I mean, how studies are manipulated on both sides, right? I mean, it's you got you got you all it takes. Okay, first of all, all those things. I mean, even after your response from Organifi, they say that. Almost every um, vegan vegan um, 
protein is going to have some sort of trace, some trace of, of it. yeah trace of metals in there. So right away you can come out and say 80, 90 percent have all. Well, no, all the, have the, the study was that uh, most of the powders had well exceeded the uh, federal limits. For right, but then metals. they take that stat, and because they took a collection of a, like maybe they picked eight random or ten random, and eight of them came up that way, they then turn around and say a stat like that. It's yeah. no different than how we reread studies on yeah. building muscle or burning fat. Is they, they take a little bit of information, then they expand mm-hmm. on it to well, so because every the shock and because every everyone I've seen so far is a third party organization. That goes out. One was done by the FDA themselves, but there were other ones that were these third-party organizations, and they come back and they're always like, most supplements are, are, are their labels are bogus. Remember the whole protein powder debacle a while ago, where they were found to be uh, spiking, uh, you know, nitrogen spiking or amino acid spiking, so that you know you, your protein powder says. 30 grams of protein per serving. Yeah, with amino re- acids, they spike it up. Yeah, but in reality, it's like 10 mm-hmm. yeah. with additional like amino acids to make it look like it's more. So it's just Sprinkle really it in there. garbage. Yeah. Like there was that. There was one done on herbal supplements a while ago where they found like this supplement says it has echinacea and all it really has in it is like wheat. Like there was there was a supplement that was uh, it was wheat pills. <laughs> These fucking assholes. They don't even have an herb in there. You know what I mean? Try this. Might as well be eating triskets. Yeah, yeah. it's like what uh, the fuck, man. But uh, it always so. And that, let me let me tell you why this makes me mad. If you guys only knew the volume and amount of stuff we took of supplement <laughs> I have taken, I'm. I know Adam is up there, but no way. I don't want to think back. You don't even come to close that. to me. Dude. I know I don't come close to you because you still have that yeah. in you. Dude. You can see it come out, dude. Especially the fitness expo. Yeah, we <laughs> go somewhere like there. We go I somewhere like watching it. Sal. Right away, yeah. I'm like, oh, look at this guy. My He's favorite. still got a little thing with the, the oh, supplements. Dude. Yeah. You're just more scientific about it when you do it. Actually, no. <laughs> He's I, like a bear to honey. I <laughs> pretend like it's scientific. Yeah. yeah, okay. First experiment combined everything. I Since I was 14, so I'm like. Man, I wonder what I got to go get tested for like heavy metals and shit like that. <laughs> oh my happen. god! I mean, I know you know. Well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. But anyway, I'm happy that Organifi got back to us so quickly, and that their testing shows that their stuff is very very clean. So, and I know that they're on the pricier side of supplements, but you get what you pay for and well, you put it in your body. That's why, because they take the time to look at yeah, stuff. Like yeah, that. Dude, yeah. Come on, so man. it makes me happy, dude. Can <clears throat> we take a moment and just recognize Adam's outfit? Yeah, dude. You know, that like, is. Like, I wore I, I, I wore it today for Taylor and he's not even oh, here. He's not even here. Yeah, I wore it for Taylor today. It's this jumpsuit, right? the jumper. It literally looks like. And now you're starting center, Adam Schaefer. No. It's like he's got like the breakaway pants and everything. I've no, had this for close to twenty years. That's not what I see, Justin. <laughs> no, you don't see that. No, what I see when I look at him is a like a like you're dressing like a mobster from the 1970s. You know, what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know how they wore the jumpsuits. It was Fila. Oh yeah. Well, that's yeah, it was, it was popular back then. It yeah. was like it was like in the early '90s and stuff. They I were love popular. jumpsuits. I've, oh, it's one of the most comfortable. Oh, I've yeah. kept it because of how comfortable it is, and it's not cheap, right? So I've had it forever. It's the it's the one pair of clothing that you can both sleep in and wear in the daytime. Right. You know what I mean? It's like 24 <laughs> right. hour clothing. You know, it, I was, yeah, it is. Have yeah, you guys yeah. watched Brennan Schaub's new Showtime show? No. I okay, so I, it. I, it's the Showtime show. I just I just watched it. And he made show, a show. he said he was talking shit about people that wear sweats in the airport. He's all, when did it become socially acceptable to also wear your fucking pajamas to fucking the airport, <laughs> right? And because he gets all, he's dressed up all the time. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know, dude. I'm listening to it. I'm like, I kind of disagree here. Yeah. Because I've, I've flown already enough times the, over to the East Coast and it's it's a motherfucker being some in some tight jeans, hey, dude. If some you're tight a professional jeans. traveler, you know, you're, you're wearing sweats. Right. And you're bringing the neck pillow. Right. Like hey, an asshole. Here's what. That's how I feel. This is, yeah. It is not about how I look when if, I get on nah. that plane. Dude. If I was going to list the top three. I mean, I'm drooling. The top three things about working in fitness, the top three for sure. One of those, maybe one or two, is the fact that I get to wear workout clothes every <laughs> day. You know how, dude, I worked in a bank. Oh, my God. Okay, so I was a premier banker in at Bank of America, which is basically you're handling like clients with a lot of money, right? And by the way, I had zero experience with this kind of stuff. I basically, I'm, this 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 it just shows my hand me my your sales, money. I'll figure it. My out. sales ability. I got, I closed them on hiring me for this this position. I hated it. Right, hated working in the bank. And there's a lot of reasons why I hated it. First of all, it's banking. It's fucking boring. And second of all, it's super quiet. You guys know my voice. You can imagine me in the back of the room trying to talk to customers <laughs> and and getting shushed by every other banker in there. Uh, and uh, one of the other reasons why I hated it, I had to wear a suit. 
Mm-hmm. Do you know how shitty that is? You know, I went through a phase where I actually wish I had a job that I could wear a suit. Yeah. Did you ever I go that? that yeah, I was in sweats while. for so long. Listen, uh-huh. I went from a dairy where I might shit on me and rubber boots on me and a full like jumper that I'm wearing when I work all day long, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I go to sweats all the day. I'm like, I just want to be clean and professional. I like, be professional. I yeah, be an adult. I, I remember on, uh, for a minute there. Just yeah. for a short, you'll minute. get over it so fast yeah. when you're forced oh, to. So uncomfortable. All Dude, you know, all I had sucks. to do was run like a couple weddings back to back to back, and I was like, okay, I'm already over. it. Think about it this way: <laughs> no how thanks. how long does it take you to get ready in the morning? Right? You're yeah. just like, oh, pff, sweats, t-shirt, and I'm I've in clocked it, too. and minutes. I'm in my uniform. Yeah. <laughs> like this is what I'm supposed to do. Like to the point where my dress up clothes, because I've been in fitness for so long, are jeans. So then, what do you think about the airport thing? I think he's. I'm. I'm, I'm going to call Brendan yeah. out on. I'm calling you yeah. out, bro. I'm gonna I, say I think he's a little too fancy. Yeah. That's how I feel. Like, yeah. There's there's things there's things to be planes suck anyway. Like you don't want to be you want to be comfortable. That's how I feel. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get all wrinkly. I anyway. get what he's saying though. I I do notice that, it dude. Is, if it was up to me, yeah, I might even you know I might even bring a blanket next time. Just walk around with a blanket. Like you know what I mean? Like you wake up. <laughs> with a, think how nice that would be. Everybody will avoid you on the plane. All cozy. Like, I mean, I guess if flu. we I guess if we were getting off a plane and we had like a big business meeting that we had to, I'd be dressed right, right? If we had, right. we have yet to have to get off a plane and walk into like an important meeting. Like we get off a plane, we normally go dude, to. The only house. time I'm wearing a, a suit is if we're in private jet status. You know what I mean? I, I, Even then, no, I know. No. I'm more comfortable. Worse. Uh, yeah, yeah, I might come in my You're boxers. Right. Yeah. If it's a private jet, we can go through all the normal. What am I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, when you do that, yeah, you own the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I got I to I, I take a peek. Can you uh, open the window real quick? Yeah. I'm just going <laughs> to sprinkle it outside. I'm going to bless the earth yeah. with my pee right now. Boy, can I just say something right now that I have to say? And I'm not going to go into detail over this because I don't talk about super personal stuff. Well, I do, but not this kind of stuff. But can I just say that, do you guys have triggers that like certain things that can get you uh, from calm, happy, cool to like, you want to like, you're like a volcano explode pissed off. Oh, Usually it's, it's certain people cause they know you so well. They want to just like, they find that button and they push me. <sighs> yeah. So I, I've, I've experienced that one recently. of the chapters in this book I was reading gets into talking about the myth of triggers. This is kind of cool, right? So, I mean, I've always thought the same way too. Like, there's certain things that that trigger me, but really, it is it's a it's it's part of how our emotions are made, and it's a series of events that not only happen like in the past or that could potentially cause you to be upset, but also what's currently happening right at that moment and at that time in your day, even. So, I've learned to take those situations that which I used to call triggered before as okay, what's going on so different with me that I allow this bullshit. To bother me. Oh, you know let me tell saying? you, buddy. Let me tell you. <laughs> That's no nothing will nothing can get you as angry as an as as your ex wife. As your ex <laughs> or your baby mama or whatever. Uh, I don't care if you're a woman or a man. Everybody knows who's gone through a divorce or whatever. See, and, because I'm from the future, I know this. Oh, this is why <laughs> fuck me. Fuck it's your future jumpsuit. Man, I was I was on cloud nine this morning, like on my way to work, like, yeah, I'm fucking ready. I'm gonna crush. It's gonna be so great. One phone call, uh, and I'm like looking at. I'm like, can I drive my car off the bridge right now? Like, this would be a great oh, idea. No. Well, without 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 giving away what what you're going what you're going through, I know something about you though that you have already admitted that you hate even dealing with that shit, anyways. Yeah. So that's what I what I look into. I go like, okay, she's this other person. I can't control them. They're this and that. But why did this trigger me so much? Out of all the things, it's not her. It's that this is an area that I don't, I don't, I already don't like dealing with. And then now you're making it more difficult for me, you bitch. Yeah, like yeah. that's what's going through your head. And if you really dig deeper, it's really less about her. And it's always, it's about, always about me. Yeah. It's always 100%. A, right, right. So why, it's 100% why about did that me. get me so mad? You know, she, does a lot of, she does a lot of stupid shit. Why does that one get me? If mad? I go deep, if I go even deeper, I have a tendency to, I, I don't, nobody likes to, to feel like they're, either being forced or they feel like they have to do something or they have to acquiesce to a situation you know, against their, their, their wishes, right? Nobody likes that feeling, right? Like I can remember when I was in school, there was a situation where I went to a junior high that was just, it wasn't a great junior high. We had a lot of gangs there, a lot of kids that, you know, coming from rough areas. And so it was, it was a bad environment. And there was one time where, I had a like a a gang of kids who forced me to well basically made me back down if you will like I had to like back down from 
a fight or chicken that would, you know, be a chicken, if you will, from a fight because there were 10 of them and there were just one of me. And it bothered me so bad that I had to acquiesce and, and cower that it bothered me so badly that the next day I found a way to fight the main, uh, you know, the main antagonist, the main dude. And then I got jumped for it. And then I went after someone else. It bothers me that bad. I can't stand it so much that that's, that's just part of my core. Maybe that's a fixed mindset and I'm sure I could fix it. But you know, when you have an ex who is the parent, you know, the other parent of your child and, you know, by the way, for all intents and purposes, we have a good relationship. So I don't want to make them sound like a, a terrible person. This is just, and this is not a me problem. This is a, I think this is an existential like problem that parents who have to co-parent have to deal with, even parent people who are not necessarily divorced and, and just together. At some point, you're going to feel like you're being forced by this under, other individual. And it's just complicated by the fact that you maybe are divorced from them. Maybe there's a lot of resentment already there. And that's why the divorce happened, all that other stuff. So when you feel like you're being forced, for me, there is almost nothing worse. It's like the worst feeling. I don't like being forced. Yeah. Like I'm the cool. And you know why? You know what it is? I know. Okay, here it is. It's such a great podcasting is a great way to process, isn't it? I am a. You guys know me. Am I not? Am I? A, would you consider me a generous? Yeah, absolutely. Individual. We all are. One hundred percent. Yeah. Like if somebody needs something from me, if you ask me. Like if you come up to me like, hey man, look, here's a situation. Like I need this help or I need this money or I need whatever. I'm nine out of 10 times, I'm going to totally want to help you. I have no problem doing that, which makes me more angry when I feel like I'm being forced to do things from someone rather than just asking me. If I feel like I'm being forced, knowing that I would probably be okay with it if you just asked, whew, that is fire, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's like internal, like, God, what is that feeling? You know what I mean? Well, you feel like, it's, I feel like there's a sun, a, a, yeah. a burning hot sun in my chest. What, it, what it is, uh, well, you, I mean, you said it a bunch of times. It's me. It's always oh, me. It's terrible. It's always me, and it's always something that I, I'm i perceiving this this way. This is what's allowing me to get angry. And so, because you can never, you can never control everybody else and all the bullshit they do. So if you find yourself getting, you know, quote unquote, triggered, then there's there's work to be done there for me. Fuck her. Fuck what oh, she's doing. That's what the she only goes. thing I can work on. Right, right. Like, I can't what? force on anybody right. else. And you know, at the end of the day, I I prefer, of course, to have a good relationship with the you know the my kid's mother. And that's for the most part what it is. And it's for of course the kids. It makes everybody work better. It's better to work together usually, right? Than unless it's a terrible, terrible situation. Mm. And I know it's me. I can only work on me. I know this. It's still though. Man. Oh yeah, it's trying. Of course, it's you know. it's a test, dude. Yeah, it's, it's a test. Uh, man. You want to make, you want to be forced to grow, like go dude. through a divorce with yeah. kids. And there's just gonna be more of you know stuff like this. That's oh, just gonna pop up. Fuck. I had a client once who um, he gave me some wisdom. I don't think he realized how much wisdom he gave me. He was married for eight years to a woman who didn't work, so she was at home. He worked, and they didn't have kids, and he was a very high uh, earning surgeon. So he's he's earning like a shit ton of money, probably a half a million dollars a year. Very, very well-known surgeon, making a lot of money. And she's at home just doing that stuff and they have no kids, right? So they get divorced. This guy, after eight years of marriage and her never working, they get divorced. He has to pay, I forgot, it was something like 15 grand a month to her in alimony for years, like four years, he had this bill of 15. And no kids? They had no kids. It was wow. alimony to her Man. because she li because she didn't work or whatever. And so now, had she worked or got married, then that would hurt, that would have reduced her alimony. Reduce it, yeah. So while she was paying her 15 grand a month, she was with a guy who was, he, she got oh, with this other bro, guy who was is, super wealthy. So do you understand how common that is? Yeah. And he refused, listen, this That's is the best so part. Common. This is the best part. She was living with this man who made all this money or dating him or something like that. And uh -huh. she'd been with him for a long time. Wouldn't get married to him because she knew. Yeah. And right He's, after the he alimony was, was... He was obviously a nice guy because if he wants... If he he could have tried to go after that. Cost like, him more money. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. He's a, he's a nice guy and I don't know where his income was, but... The, he, he told me... I mean, I had this conversation with him and he's like, listen, man. He goes, it's just... Trust me. He goes, I've gone uh, you know, up, down, left, right with this. He goes, I'm just not... By the way, this is not my situation. This is not why I'm giving you this example. It was just reminding me of this. And he said to me, he goes, you know, like, 
if I fight it, it's going to cost me more. So I'm just going to do it and, and that's it. And I just release it because otherwise he goes for a year, it fucking stressed me out so bad. And it was a learning lesson for me because I saw this. I'm like, well, I guess there's a lot of logic in that. You know, sometimes you're forced to do something and it's like, in reality, I mean, I guess you could try to fight it, but that would be a worse option. So you're actually choosing the option that's better. So in reality, it's not force, right? Well, it's 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 less of fighting and more it's it's, it's that's kind of if she's doing it intentionally like that, that's it's unfair. Like if you've been living together with this guy, for, if she could go prove that they're been they've been living together for a certain amount of time, and I don't know what I that don't know is. if they were living together or she was just dating the guy. Oh yeah, if she's just dating, well then he's fucked. Yeah, you know what that's I'm what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, I, you're cause, fucked. Cause you're the, nothing the, around that. Oh, the best part is after he. F- Paid his last payment. She got married to the other guy. She married him. <laughs> the last <laughs> payment. Yeah. It's okay, like, I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> it's funny you're bringing this up because I was having this conversation yesterday with a, a old client of mine, and her um, her boyfriend is you know been divorced for I think like ten years or whatever like that from his wife. He gave the house, the four million dollar house, to her that she lives in, and he pays her alimony. And I guess they just found out uh, yesterday that she was, she's, um, or he's now, excuse me, she's now engaged to get married. And she, you could tell she's like all in this good mood. And she's like, oh, yeah, no, he's ex- ex- so excited. And like, she's like, that'll increase his income by 25%. And I know this this guy's, you know, he's interviewing Elon, or he's he's a lawyer for like Elon Musk. So he's all, that's a big chunk. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I'm like, damn. Think of, you know how crazy that would be if like if you're just used to for years giving 25% yeah. of your income like that. And when you're making millions of dollars like that, what that could be like. I wow. think that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> God, what's man. what's worse when you have tens of millions and someone takes half that and you make five million, or when you make 50,000 and someone takes half that and they make 25,000? I don't what's know. What's worse? It, if you're it all less, relic- it's going to hurt, right? Uh, you know, it all hurts. Though, it all hurts, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. The, well, the the way the laws are set up, uh, men usually get the sh- when it comes to that kind of stuff, we'll get the short end of the stick. And I know why they they design the laws that way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of people get screwed. Hey, Although I've seen women get screwed too, though. I yeah. had a client who she worked, made a lot more money than her husband did, and she had to end up paying him. Oh, I'm you know, sure. Stuff, yeah, so. I'm sure it goes both ways. Speaking of big money and stuff, uh, did you guys see Toyota? One point eight billion dollars they're investing right now into the race, dude. It's everybody is on this race to the self driving cars, and it's. I mean. I really feel like this is way closer than what I thought it was before. I mean, maybe, Bro, you're, yeah. you're talking about a, a technology that's going to radically transform radically society. Transform. Dude, Apple's working on that under the wraps. I guarantee it. Of no, course. they all are. They yeah, talk they, about in the article. It, they, they have a specific so car ha- for it. Literally what's happening right now is you have companies like Toyota who are actually investing themselves you know, billions of dollars to actually keep it all in-house to where they are doing it. Then you have other companies that are speaking to companies like Google and Apple and that are like working together together because they're going to create the software. They'll be the big powerhouse company. So, you know, it's interesting because it makes me think, what do you think is the better strategy? Do you think if you're Volkswagen, if you're VW, if you're Toyota or you're one of these, these big cars, right? Uh, Is it smarter for you to, you know, Partner I'll up, partner up with a tech company. Of course, hundred percent. Of course, I, see, I don't know. Hundred percent. Here's why I don't know if I agree with that. No, because they're you know them trying to all of a sudden like create a like technology and the the infrastructure for that like back end front end. Mm-hmm. Um, they've never done that before. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've done it on like a, a yeah, microchip if, level. If you if you invest in one point eight billion dollars, that means you went out and got a team. And you but got where pe- are you getting them from? They're right. getting. BC players at best, yep. you maybe. know, like Apple maybe. or, dude, or they've, recruiting they've, from those places. No, I, no, I don't know about that. I have that. to agree with Justin. Yeah. I have to agree 100% with Justin. Imagine if a car manufacturer today said, we are going to manufacture our tires. We're going to manufacture our oil. We're going to make everything ourselves in-house. Look, a, a, a Toyota will never make a tire as good yeah. as a tire company. To create the technology to navigate a car also requires the infrastructure with maps. Uh-huh. With like Google owns that shit. Like oh, they've mastered it. Yeah, like you're. That's a that's a uh, it's a it's a typical play that companies do. That typically not always. This is why I'm so excited about. That's oh, why I'm so excited yeah. about the this. The opposite though. Think okay. So I know Apple's so arrogant that they're gonna take. They're gonna create their own car. They've that's never right. done a car industry before. They've never been a part of it. But guess what? They went into you know, like the the phone industry, and then all of a sudden they create. You know what? I, this reminds me of being a kid and watching like Royal yeah. Rumble, dude. Like everybody's <laughs> in the ring, dude, and yeah. and you have all kinds of different strengths and body types. You have no idea who's going to come out. I'm really fascinated by it because then you throw in like a company like Uber. Yeah, I mean, and you could argue these guys the way they are covering. 
covering space and ground right now. It's like, fuck you. Well, I feel like uh, if anybody, like, and this is my own personal thought, is that has has an advantage over everybody, it's Tesla. Just because of the fact they've already been incorporating, um, you know, technology within the cars, cloud-based technology where they give constant updates. Like, they have, like, that system in place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, they're ready. That's Here, how, that's the, I like, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I like Tesla a lot in this. I, I, I like them a lot in this. Yeah. So, so what I, what I think when I look at this is, first off, uh, you have, what's going to change more dramatically than anything and what's going to be a, the, one of the biggest fundamental shifts is the shift from private car ownership. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Right? No so doubt. private car ownership will be largely a thing of the past in mm. the relatively near future because it will be so cost uh, effective to not own a car. I believe the next car I buy will be the last car I buy. Probably. I do. I, I've true. already thought about, about, about this right now. Like, if my, I, have, I have three vehicles that are like either approaching or over 100,000 miles right now, and I'm going... I was telling Katrina the other day, I was like, you know, we really should get a new car. And I'm like, ah, we're getting ready to get the house right now. I don't want to do this. is not a smart thing to do right now. Let's just tough it out. We have no payments or anything, right? So, but I'm going like, this might be the last car I buy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I kind of want to, <laughs> I kind of want to buy one last cool car because well, so, I really, because I really think it's yeah. going to be stupid to have well, one in about 10, 15 years. Well, so think years. about this. Think really, about this. Think about true. the difficulty that a company like Toyota, Ford, Chevy, you know, think of how difficult of a transition it is for these companies that are built on, entirely built on private car ownership. Mm-hmm. They have to completely change their business model. That's a massive shift. And I don't think they'll be able to do it and compete with companies that are already poised around not private car ownership like Uber. Right. Like Uber is already designed Uber around and that. Tesla. Watch that's, out. Yeah. That's my point. So I do not, I think the old dogs who's our, who, are fucked. Okay, who's our front three? I think those are the front runners. What are the front three? Apple, Uber, yep. and, and Tesla. Yep, I would say things like Lyft, Uber, Google, yeah, Lyft. Apple are in the running. Uh, Uber's ahead of Lyft. I'm not yeah. worried about Lyft. I th- Uber. I think yeah. I like Uber. I like Apple. I like I like Tesla. I like Elon Musk. Let's just you know let's just think about this. Can't first. bet against the guy that fucking. Let's think if about he sends his own, he wants sends his own him, rocket yeah, in he's, space. Come on, like he's, he's like, gonna get it done. He's a, he's a doer. That's the only reason why I'm, I I don't know if I'm counting on Tesla because that motherfucker's got so much on his plate that he may he's trying to conquer something yeah, else right, it, right now. It all he's trying to get, if he wants it. He's like in the I think I believe he's more in the, like the lunar cycle idea, right? Like that's where he's heading. He's heading more of that direction. So maybe he he's doesn't interstellar like, travel. Right, right. He's like you guys are fucking around with how we're gonna get around Earth. Get around Earth. Like fuck Earth. We're not gonna be on Earth. That's old news. Earth. I'm trying to get to the so that's the only Andromeda complex. <laughs> the only reason why Tesla might not be in my top three. There's definitely not the number one because of They're that. Too forward thinking. Well, think about yeah. it this way. Let's just think about, for example, the the design of a car. Let's like a car is designed, and it has been since day one, to be around the driver, to be centric around passenger bound, around the driver who controls the entire car. Right. When there is no driver. What does that look like inside yeah. the car? Do they keep the Dude. wheel like just in case as a safety, or do you sit facing? Do they get rid of it? Do you sit facing forward like you always do, Dude, or does it become how- an office? Yeah, it comes uh, with an office. Well, that's definitely. my hundred percent. It comes yeah. like an office. We're, that's what I, I think the future of cars, self-driving cars, look like. Little work desks. They could yeah. be. Oh, I mean, some of them just, may look different. Some of them may be bars. You may have a traveling van that drives around, picks you up and your friends. And look at this is. Yes. I mean, we're 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 in the thick of it all with the Silicon Valley, right? And I, I mean, everybody I know, I don't know anybody that doesn't have besides maybe ourselves that don't have, and even us. I think Justin's got it. So no, yeah. everybody I know has a thirty-two hour plus commute every single morning and and every single night going back mm-hmm. home minimum. So that's one to two hours productivity of productivity every single day that people could be doing, which is why we see texting and driving so bad right now. I know. Everybody does it because everybody's like, holy shit, I'm multitasking. I could be yeah, working, I'm answering. I'm sitting here. Yeah, yeah I'm well. sitting in traffic. I may as well answer stuff. So Think of all the wasted space that we have in society that's due to parking cars. How much of your home yeah. is dedicated to parking your car? How much time is dedicated dedicated to trying to find parking or taking care of your car taking care of your car right. how much uh, how many people are car killed what? every year through through car accidents and drunk drivers yeah. traffic which is largely the result of human error will mostly be gone so that hour commute if you're not driving and all these cars are synchronizing and, and measuring off of each other might turn into a 20 minute drive yeah. does that now mean that for example one of the reasons why silicon valley is so expensive is people are trying to get closer to where their work is. Mm-hmm. Well, if it's self-driving cars and traffic is kind of a thing of the past and all that stuff, are people going to spread out even further? 
Is that going to cause people to now want to move to? For you know, it's not a big deal to move to an hour and a half away. Hundred percent, dude. I'll tell you right now. Yeah. If, I mean, being someone who's shopping right now, if I were to buy a house with this technology currently running, I would for sure buy like an hour away. Who cares if it's an hour? I mean, that's just an hour. I get up, now I can have my coffee on the road. I could be working on yeah. my, answering all my emails before I get here. Oh, it would for sure. And I know I could get into a house that's potentially Morning cheaper. Morning conference call. Like you just for do sure. It all in your car. Now think about this, freeing up of the elderly, the freeing up of children. Yeah. Think about all the times you have to take your kids here, Soccer there. and practice. And, yeah, yeah, you give them their cell phone so you could track them and you go, okay, take the, you know, I'm call, I called your, your Uber or whatever yeah. it's taking you to soccer like all these things are going to be like it's going to change society on because cars change society in fundamental ways anyway like right cars were part of the right. we industrial revolution wagons to automobiles was a huge fucking well deal. highways everybody, freeways right? like change suburbs how we live how we how we you know yeah, how we built uh buildings dude it's it's gonna be it's gonna be i don't think people realize just how crazy it's gonna be but what do you guys think are gonna are the largest obstacles to that type of a transition. Wow. Regulation. Um, yeah, got 100%. It. 100%. Yeah, regu- yeah, 100%. Laws. Regulations. Yeah, yeah. Regulations. Yeah, if we took that off right now, it'd be it, fucking here tomorrow. It. Yeah, yep. it'd be here tomorrow. It yep, really yep, would. Yep. But and who and so I think that you're going to see some lobbying to keep regulations to fight this new transformation happening. Maybe the big car manufacturers. Well, wh- how do you start it? Do you just start with certain freeways that are only self-driving? You know what I mean? Where it's like that, because I, I see, I foresee like a problem being like somebody that's driving their own car, trying to change mm-hmm. lanes and like a self-driving car is just, you know, like it doesn't really have the they'll, same response. Hundred percent, they'll have to be dedicated lanes and yeah. separate the two because there will be an overlap and a transition I, when that happens. You won't go from we won't yeah. go. I think from, we'll see a lot of assholes that don't want to like right, succumb right. to that. Yeah. Right. I yeah. think we'll see private private roads, private freeways, private highways. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, what did what what did the the wagon to automobile transition look like? People just navigate around each other. I don't I don't see. I, look, if if a car is self is autonomous, it has to be able to navigate I, around. I can't other picture people. a wagon yeah. and an automobile on the same. On oh the yeah, all the time. I had to have, yeah, right. Yeah. Oh yeah, they I had horses. I just can't picture it right now. Can yeah. you? Yeah, have no, you seen, it's just you navigate. And you it's seen just an image of that? Have you seen an image of that? No. You know, eventually, uh-huh. I, I can pull it up easy. I, eventually, what'll happen is it'll be illegal. Doug, to drive. I think ask Doug. Doug was old enough. He was. He remembers that. <laughs> hey Doug. No, Doug. Doug was riding dinosaurs. Yeah. 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 Pterodactyl. Pterodactyl. Yeah. You're. you're uh, it, eventually, it'll be illegal to drive. They'll make it to where, like it is now, like you can't ride a horse on the freeway, you know what I mean? Yeah. At some point, they're going to be like, okay, it's illegal for you to drive your own. So what vehicle. I wonder then is, is my is my Camaro going to be fucking worth so much money yeah. or is it going to be worth nothing? Yeah, it's either I think one it'll or the be, other. No, I think it'll be worth way more. Yeah. It'll be, like a muse- it'll be put in a museum. I think it'll be right? worth way more. Right? You know what's going to go up in popularity? Uh, four-wheeling. Guaranteed. Because like they'll make parks shit. and yeah, you know, stuff dedicated to like off roading and you know, I I could just see that as being like oh, m- I get what more you're of saying. an adventure like oh, oh I'm driving a car whoa you know. what a great point yeah what a great point like, I could l- I could let's to- make a business around that. right and tra- I mean you we already have these tracks where you can go race you can go drive a Corvette or drive a Ferrari or do that yeah. for the day and they like, rent- remember what driving a yeah. crazy vehicle God, was like you're probably yeah. right that's yeah. a good call I like that call. yeah and, and think that's about- a great way to transition it out too you know what I'm saying and like, also think yeah. about the amount of money that you spend on a car and on car insurance and on gas compared to how much you'll spend on these services that'll pick you up. Like the last estimates I read were something like $3,000 a year they estimate it'll cost a person to, to, to use one of these cars. $3,000 a year is nothing compared to how much we spend on cars, insurance, gas. Are you gas. kidding? It's, what, it's totally nothing. So imagine now that, incre- that, that, deal. that increased wealth that we have now as a result of that, what that's going to do for society and where people are going to invest that kind of stuff, like this is going to be a huge explosion for just so what do they societies. anticipate? Like Toyota, do they give themselves like a, a date or a projected? No, time see, I, frame? I'm not reading anything like that. Like I don't. No one's saying like this is happening. Because and I think it goes the back regulation. to regulations, right? Yeah. I think, but I think when you see companies spending billions of dollars in it, it's here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's not. It, this isn't a matter of like, oh, it's gonna ha-. like some people. We we're. I felt like two years ago. We were talking about it yeah. like as like oh man I know it's a future- cool sci-fi story yeah, yeah right but now it's like it's for sure here you don't go spend billions of dollars like that if you know that this isn't the future and this is what I think I think everyone's gone back and done the math is what Sal's talking about and I think if you're if you are a multi-billion dollar company like Toyota and you sit down with all your guys you go uh oh. 
this is a real reality. And this yeah. means, and any anybody would be a fool not to just pay three thousand. I mean, that's like mm-hmm. to have a, a new car and to eliminate. I mean, I would pay close to ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Yeah. I mean, when you add in gas, washing your car, maintenance on the car, car payment, all those, all time those lost. Oh, you know, all like yeah, time lost. Business. All those yeah. things like. Oh, I would pay. I would pay three times that amount. Bro, public so. public transportation will be a thing of the past because you're going to have ride sharing uh, buses and stuff that people can actually pay privately, and it'll be cheap as fuck yeah. when it's autonomous. I wish. See, what I would like to do is figure out a way to invest in the products and things that are going to explode as a result of that. For example, like electric car batteries. Like I bet you those, or you know, electric engines. Like if you could figure out how to invest in something like that, because for sure, these uh, autonomous cars or whatever are going to probably mostly be elect- electric, right? Because then they'll go to their charging station mm-hmm. of whatever company charge and then go out and do their job. Plus, it's cleaner, you know, for the environment. It, it some extent, it can some extent. be. It's some extent, it can see, be. Again, this is I mean, where I see. It's just think. efficient yeah, money wise, I think. Right. I see companies like a Toyota that would, I, I think they would all be in house, you know? Like if you're getting the if you're building the technology to figure out the software piece, you've already got the car piece mastered. You you better figure their battery. I mean, Tesla's all in house. That don't they, they they do their own batteries too, right? Or do they contract those out? I think they do yeah, make, their own, they make their own batteries. Yeah, right, yeah. I think they do too. I think you would keep it all in house. So yeah. it's probably it's really goes back to who we think is like the the race leaders in this. That's what well, I'm. That that's the thing. That's a good point because Tesla does have like an advantage with batteries. They've They've definitely owned that market. Well, Toyota does, has their own with Prius, right? They've yeah. done. They've that's done, true. They've done that too. So I mean, that's what I'm saying. I don't. I don't know if there's going to be a side company that would make their batteries, or if they would. I don't know enough about this to to really speculate. But I, I would think that you would keep it all in house as much as you possibly can. That's why I, I don't know if I agree with you on the contracting out. Just because, I, but I do get where you're coming from as far as the software. These guys are professionals at creating that. They would be best for that. But I do see that this being an ongoing, constantly having to upgrade, constantly having to write more code, constantly having to evolve and get better. And it be a, and I think I would instead of ha- always having to write, you know, fucking Google a million dollar check every month. Right. It's like let's invest it's the one point cost effect. Right. Let's 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 invest the one point eight billion. We may not be the leader. We may not be first. We may have to learn from them. We may have to reverse engineer all of their stuff. But at least we'll control it financially in yeah. our house, and we won't be dependent. It's like the Intel Pentium processor on the inside, right? You know, but you have like exactly Google or Apple. exactly. Yeah. I mean, Google. If you you give Google, Apple, whoever these people that are right or whatever companies are doing the software for these company these uh, these these car companies. You got a lot of power, bro. That's a lot of power you're giving them just because you want to be first or you think you want to have the best software. Yeah. I don't know. I might have more of an Apple approach with let's just get it out there and then somebody else will try and do it and then we'll one up them again real quick because we've got the manpower. I think the big, the first ones to really make this happen are also taking a massive risk because <laughs> yeah. one, just one regulation. accident. Yeah. No, or, one or, accident. Just one. Will cause the regulation. Will, will be a, and you know, the funny thing is people are scared so easily, right? So they'll be like, oh my God, self driving car explodes in fire. Oh. And everybody's going to freak out. It's like, well, statistically speaking, that's so who's that's really, way less than the. Yeah, who's really been splashing and tiptoeing into it is Uber and Tesla. Uh, Tesla. That's Tesla. it. Yeah. Those are the two. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. So that's it'll, why I think they have an advantage. It'll know? be very interesting. I like them. So I got a cool article I've been, I just quickly will go over with you guys that I thought was interesting. So I read this in uh, Medical Express, it's a website. Um, the title of the article is Nervous System Puts the Brakes on Inflammation. So there's cells in the nervous system that uh, put the brakes on immune responses to infections in the gut and lungs that, and pre- that prevent excessive inflammation. Now, this is interesting. This is because very interesting. This huh? is showing that the CNS system, the central nervous system, communicates directly with the immune system well, th- to we control know. inflammation. Okay, well, when you say that, wow. we know that. We know that stress could cause the gut to be inflamed. So if you have a high-stress life, you're more likely to probably have leaky gut or some sort well, of Well, this is showing that the immune system can actually also can suppress, it suppress too. and block it. Yeah. So, I mean- it's so funny, you know what I mean? This whole like mind, body, spirit, meditate and da 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 and be spiritual and it sounded so hokey. Yeah. Like 10 years ago. Like rich, holy witchcraft. Holy yeah. shit, they were right. Yeah. Right. Like how right they were. were. Yeah, but how naive how naive of us to think they weren't considering we've only been on this earth for 37 years. We've in and, and this shit's been going on for 
thousands of right. years you know say thousands of years well you see like, like shaolin monks you know like how they're just so intuitive like they're just so in tune with their own body and the systems and like listening to the communication process like they can do amazing what seems like superhuman things and it's just like they're just on that level dude or- it's your it's your state of mind makes such a big impact in how your body reacts and responds to both your food to your activity to your life um, and then, of course, and this is the easy connection, your state of mind also, of course, per, you know, uh, uh, causes you to make certain decisions and stuff. So it's just, mm. it's it, it really is a positive feedback loop. Yeah. Now, now, positive feedback loop for for the listeners who aren't familiar, uh, when you know you ever have a microphone that you're speaking into and there's speakers, and then you get the microphone close to the speaker and it makes that loud noise. Yeah, what's happening is the microphone is picking up very small sounds from the speaker which is then getting amplified, which is then it's getting picked up and getting, back in. and it's yeah. amplifying it like crazy. Mm-hmm. This is what happens when we, with our connection from our mind and our emotions to our body. So, mm-hmm. you know, if I have a little bit of inflammation in my gut and that causes me to stress out, that stress then causes more inflammation uh, in the gut, which compiles, then causes, uh-huh. and it can go the reverse. I can be anxious or stressed or I'm not dealing with something. So I'm suppressing something hmm. which causes this emotional feeling which then causes inflammation which causes me to feel worse and it just does this positive this, feedback that's a really good this analogy makes you me, there. yeah that was awesome yeah. this this actually makes me think a lot of Wim Hof and like why like his practices were so successful and when they tested him and how he was able to then you know um, I, I don't remember what specific bacteria it was that like they tested with I think it was E. coli or something mm-hmm. like that where they injected like oh these, and he fought it yeah and he fought it and he, he basically didn't get any of the um, effects you know, the crazy That's some ninja to, shit, right? Yeah, there. just just by calming. You this. know, here's the thing: like, think about it this way. Um, if if we went, if we took humans from a thousand or two thousand years ago and brought them today, they would probably be in absolute awe and wonder with the average human's ability to organize, schedule, navigate technology, uh, articulate with their fingers on new technology, being able to read symbols and convey messages. And they'd be like, oh my God, you guys are ninjas. You guys are brilliant. You guys are geniuses. No, the truth is we've just been practicing since we were children. The thing that we haven't practiced at all, at all in Western societies is this mindfulness practice. So that's why when we look at people like Wim Hof, they're like Superman or they're like gods. The reality is they just practice. They practice. And That's he, it. He's communicating with his autonomic system. That's he, it. He's figured it out. Totally possible if you make this a regular. It's funny now that I coach, when I coach people now, this is becoming more and more and more a part of their coaching where I'm having them stop before you Breathing eat. Breathing sessions stop. and stuff, huh? Yeah, dude. Know. You know, yep. you know because, and, the, and the, the, the difference is I can sell it now because I understand it really well. So now people actually comply. Whereas in the past, they'd be like, hey. Like it's an important thing. Yeah, I have swear. a mindfulness practice. What the fuck yeah. does that mean? I don't want to do that. <laughs> what do you mean? I get plenty of sleep or whatever. Right. It's It makes a tremendous difference in your physical body and, phys- and how it actually operates. And so I read this article this morning and I was thinking about this. And I was thinking about, God, how do I, like I'm communicating it right now and I know people listening are like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Like, where do I start? What does that look like? And I've also talked about in the past how, um, you know, you know, when we talked about things like intuitive eating, like taking care of yourself like someone you care about and that tends to resonate with people. And I thought to myself, like the best starting point for all of this is really that. The best starting point really is understanding that and understanding this, like how you feel about yourself, how you take care of yourself, how you allow the state of mind you allow yourself to be in, the emotional state you allow yourself to be in or that you are in is in direct uh, relation or directly connected to how you love yourself or the empathy you have for yourself or how you view yourself. And, and, and I'll explain even further. If you were in the care of, uh, let's imagine you were a, 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 you had a prison and you had a prison a prisoner in there and they were just a person you hated. You just fucking hated them. You did not like them at all. They were bad people. You would treat them as such. Now imagine if you had to care for somebody, but you love them, you care for them. Maybe it was your own child. The way you behave towards them, the way you treated them would be as such. Now, if you view yourself in that same way as somebody that you hate because I have no discipline, I'm too stressed out, I'm not doing enough for the, you know these things that I could be doing, I made this bad decision... Of course you can, you're going to treat yourself terribly and of course you're going to have a state of mind 
that because you have to deal with yourself. There's one person in the world you can't escape, yeah. and that's yourself. So if I hate Justin, if I hate Adam, I can just make a choice and be like, well, I'm out of here. I'm not going to fucking work with you guys. I live with me. The only I'll escape, find you. Yeah, the only potential possible escape would be obviously suicide, which is an, you know, which is not an option, obviously. So if I have to live with this person, I have to learn to love myself like somebody I care about, and that's the root or the foundation of where this all comes from. If you can do that, and it really begins with this, it's like I look at the decisions I made in the past, and I start to realize like, okay, I made some bad decisions, or I wasn't disciplined, or I did things to myself that weren't the greatest. I can see that I made those mistakes. I can see that I also try to do better. And so I forgive myself. And right now I'm making the choice to try to stop doing that to the best of my ability. Now I can start to love myself because now I'm a person deserving of empathy because I've made that decision. I've made that, I've, I've admitted that in the past I wasn't so good to myself. I've also forgiven myself and had empathy towards myself. That doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect moving forward. It's just acknowledging that now moving forward, I'm going to be someone that's going to try to live in a way where I'm caring for somebody that I actually care about. Once you start right there, that's where I think the mindfulness practice can start to come from because now I'm like, okay, now I can sit here. I can try to be calm. I can try to breathe. Gives I can you try a to new care. perspective than instead of making it into work. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then that, of course, feeds the physical and then the physical now feeds the mental because what happens is that positive feedback loop works in the opposite too. If you start to create this mental space and emotional state that brings things down to a healthy level, that makes you start to feel better emotionally. That will reflect itself in your physical self. And so now I'm feeling less physical symptoms of stress, less physical symptoms of anxiety, less physical symptoms of inflammation, which now means I physically feel better, which now feeds back right into this emotional state of well-being. So now I've created a positive feedback loop in the direction that I want. Right. So understanding that, I think, makes a huge difference. Oh, it makes a, hu a huge difference. You just kind of grazed over the suicide thing, but that suicide and depression, that it's the lack of self-love, and to it's the lack of being able to connect to yourself totally. like that is where that where that all stems from. Totally. You know, this is kind of a dark question, but I wanted to ask Doug. Doug, what is, do you know, like, with the like, insurance and stuff like that, like, where... Uh, if like suicide, is that normally in the oh, life insurance or even depression or anything? Do they ask questions like that? Typically it will be medical questions in regards to depression. So if Medication, you have a history yeah. of going to a doctor for depression or if you're on some type of a antidepressant, they'll ask those questions. And yeah, absolutely. Those will be factored in. Yeah, because if you have health and or if you have life insurance like Health IQ, and you were to take your your own life, you would would, it, would that yeah they would they think they give you a year to wait right? I Doug? think it's a two year two. waiting period typically. What do you mean after. it's a two year waiting period? So if, well, if you buy a policy yeah. and in the first two years you take your life, nobody gets anything. Oh, okay. So if I had it, if I've had it for. 10 years of my life and then I took it, then I'd be... You yeah, that's whoever, a different story. Not that I'm encouraging anyone to do yeah, that. Yeah, whoever your yeah. benefactor is gets it then. <laughs> so <laughs> what they're trying to prevent... Well, it's very dark, but it's a reality. Well, yeah, yeah it's a reality and it was on my mind this weekend. Yeah. That's why I was just thinking about that. And so I... I didn't even think like, and I know that we're, this is, we're sponsored by. So, I mean, and yes. So Health IQ, one of the reasons why they, they can charge so little for life insurance is because they're working with a pool of healthy individuals. So all those factors are much lower, including uh, things like suicide and depression, which are it's strongly correlated to poor physical uh, health or not exercising. So right. if you exercise and you eat right, the odds that you'll suffer from depression are much lower. And in some studies show that exercise and diet are as effective as antidepressant drugs and in the long term, more effective. And I, I think the reason why they may show that they're more effective in the long term, because of course I'm going to side with exercise and eating, right? But I think the reason why they may be better is because of the growth, the self and personal growth that come along with the, the prolonged, yeah. Yeah, the prolonged right. consistency with exercise and diet. So what insurance companies do is they pool all their people together. And although you pay based on your risk factor, you also pay a little bit based on the other risk factors because they have to pay out other people. So what Health IQ did is they took a pool of all healthy people. So now they can charge less to you because you're healthy, but even less because you're all risk. their other customers yeah. are, low, are low risk. Right. So if you're a fit individual, a healthy individual, and you still want life insurance, which I think is smart, 
then you want to go to a company that only tries to work with other healthy That's how you're going to get the best deal. That's, yeah. how, that's why when Doug did it, he, it was like cheaper yeah. than all the other ones he compared them to. Yeah, and actually Health IQ is an agency. So what they're doing is they're going out and looking they're at- They're brokering, basically. Yeah, they're basically looking at all these different companies and they say, okay, I got somebody who's a preferred yeah. risk class. This person's extremely healthy. Who can give me the best rates? Yeah. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now, so, obviously, the payout is different based on, like, if someone took their life two years versus 10 years later, the payout's obviously... Yeah, the payout will be the same. For example, if you have a term life policy and it's a million-dollar policy, then the payout's a million dollars. The thing is, they think, well, if you're suicidal, you're not going to wait two years, right? Right, right. So the idea is to make people wait and... Uh, I, I wonder if they actually have stats on that, right? Like That's someone, why it's two years. Right, right. There's a, there's probably a... I, like yeah, a they, they have come I'm up sure with that number. A, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of money in they knowing... They factored that in. Yes, there's well, a lot for, of money in knowing this For shit. sure, there, or else anyone who's almost suicidal that has family or has stuff like that and thinks, like, oh, I want to make sure everyone's taken care of before I go, sure. like, that would be a strategy, right? Like, for people, because at that point, you don't... It's... it's Well, I guess you don't really care about anybody else, too, because your the self-love isn't there, too. You're probably so deep in your depression. I don't know if you're forward-thinking It's a, I don't... I, w- I wouldn't even... Yeah. Well, who are we talking to? Where we were talking to someone, and they were saying how they were talking with a friend, and, th- and that the argument was, well, heaven is a place here, like on earth, and they were trying to make that argument, and they were having a debate where the other person's like, no, heaven's not here, and it, that's not possible. And then, uh, you know, I brought this thought to myself, and I said, well, for something to exist, the opposite has to also exist. In other words, if light doesn't exist without dark, you know, hot doesn't exist without cold because you don't have the contrast. Like, uh, if, if if there was no cold, then the hot wouldn't be hot. It would right. just be okay. Water. So, so you get if what somebody I'm can experience a heaven, then so, uh, on vice, you know, the opposite to that could be true with somebody like experiencing hell. Well, or- what, what my point with that was, if people think that heaven on earth or heaven in that in the you know whatever the sense that you think heaven is uh, in in you know here on earth. If they think that that's not possible, then I ask them this question. Do you think being in total hell is possible on earth? Nobody will deny that. <laughs> Everybody yeah. will be like, oh, that's totally possible. Well, if that's, that doesn't, now, if that's possible, which I think, I mean, people who commit suicide probably lived in a, in a hell, right? Yeah. If that's possible, then so is living in a heaven. I just think it's more common to be in a hell than to be in a heaven. That's all. I don't think it's impossible. So it actually gives me, it makes me feel good hmm. knowing that, oh shit, the opposite is just as it's possible as well. Right, right. You know? Team fireproof. That's right. <laughs> Queen Quas. The ankle has landed. Chimera Quas. Today's Quas is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking qua. The eagle has landed. Qua. First question is from Gatchered. Should seniors with decent health be doing foundational lifts like deadlifts, barbell squats, bench overhead press, or focus more on functional exercise or... A mix of both. You know what? You know what I like about this. Th- this Those are functional exercises. Thank you. Yeah. Boom. This this yeah. highlights the one of the biggest misunderstandings in exercise yeah. right now or right. in fitness right now, right. which is that nothing fu- nothing could be more functional. Those are the most than, functional exercises than a squat and a deadlift and arguably an overhead press. I mean that that is as functional of a movement. And if you cannot do that, then I think I mean that shouldn't the, be balancing. That's on one the leg prerequisites for almost yeah. everything else, right? So if you can't do that exactly, you shouldn't be doing some cool mobility thing that someone you see somebody doing on video because you already know mechanically they're going to be broken on that if they can't do a squat properly and so learning how to look at your clients mechanics in a squat or a deadlift even if they're 90 years old and look where where they're not moving properly and then address that now this is exactly why too like you know we created programs like maps prime pro is you know this really is is i i think a program where i would as a trainer uh, training clients, I probably would refer to Prime Pro more more than any other program that we've released, in my opinion. I don't know about you guys, but oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I had somebody with some sort of chronic pain somewhere, and because of that, it's caused dysfunction in their movement, 
And I was always try- that's how I learned. I mean, I, yeah. I I would see a client like that, and they would, and then I had to go dig deeper. Like, why is that happening? And what what muscles? And are the in the go to like initial thought for most trainers is like, well, what can I substitute this with now? You know, and then they never really come back to the barbell training, and and so it becomes this thing that they just avoid. Versus like, well, what can we work on? How can we build ourselves back to where our joints are supported and stable, so we can actually go through these types of did you. Did Movies. you guys ever do this? Like, so I used to like if it was like uh, like an advanced stage, like really advanced stage client that is just really hard time squatting. The whole workout would be revolved around trying to get them to be able to squat. Of better. course, yeah. Like that's the workout. That's the goal. You it's break not, it into. It's not like biceps and then some triceps no. and then it's like the goal is to be able to do a squat. That's it. One of right. the most fundamental movements. Right, and yeah. then I'm doing all the things to complement that, especially the squat, getting up and out, down from you know sitting in in your chair. Like that's like as as you progress in age, mm-hmm. that's such an important Here, thing. Here's what's functional: strength. Yeah. S- strength is the foundation for all physical pursuits. And especially as you get older, if you look at all of the the physical ailments that uh, that happen to uh, seniors or individuals in advanced age, they all can get rooted back to lack of strength, lack of muscle, all of them. So, yeah. bone bone uh, density loss. Well, that's that's a lack of strength. You're losing your balance. That's a loss of a loss of strength. Uh, lack of strength, uh, the breaking a bone and then re- being in, you know bedridden for a while, which then results in, in terrible outcomes. That's because you lack strength. You don't lack the strength to heal, or you lack the strength to prevent yourself from hurting yourself in the first place. Then you look at all the the more minor things like your lack of your 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 lack of individual ability. Like you know, as you get older, like I can't reach that thing over my head anymore, or I can't close my trunk, or I can't walk up the stairs. Like that's all. Uh, a strength issue and senior citizens who maintain strength have far better outcomes than those that don't maintain strength and their quality of life is is you know way improved when they maintain strength dude i got a client who i had a client who i trained for about seven years and now he trains with uh jessica so he's still working out but he's god how old is He's got to be Jim now is I think seventy. Is that the swimmer guy? Five maybe seventy five. I think he's about seventy. You know, Jim was he actually was. Uh, is that your swimmer guy you talking yeah, about? Yeah, okay. he helped us film Maps Anabolic when we first filmed it. He actually came and volunteered and would hold like uh, like test the sound and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. But I think he's like seventy. I want to say seventy five or maybe even seventy eight now. But this guy swims for an hour straight every day, and he's been doing it for forty years. So for forty years. And this is the most consistent motherfucker you've ever met in your life. Consistently, every night, he'll swim for an hour lap straight, like nonstop. Nice. Uses a steam and sauna every single day. Lifts weights at least three to four days a week, pretty consistently with a good level of intensity. So here you have this man who's on the upper end of 70. And I believe he's getting, yeah, I think he's like 78. The guy never hurts himself. His balance is incredible, can do pull-ups, can do all these different things. Got his testosterone, his testosterone levels checked. Tested at almost seven hundred. Oh, it's embarrassing. Okay, almost at seven, <laughs> almost at seven hundred. That, uh, that stings. Yeah. Poor Adam. <laughs> and it, you know, he just got the flu. Like he just got the flu recently. Now, the flu that's been going around uh, has been a pretty bad oh, one. Oh, it's been a horrible one this it, year. It's actually killed more people than than normal. It's been a pretty nasty one, right? Yeah. So this guy gets the flu. He's in the age category of people that are fucked if they get the flu. Like people in their you know late seventies, they get the this kind of a flu. Yeah. Like okay, everybody, you know, buckle up because this might end up bad. It might turn into some. The dude was sick for three days. Three yeah. days. He had a fever for one. In two days of rest, he's like, "Yeah, I just didn't swim." And I slept because I called him on the phone to check on him because Jessica's like, "Oh, Jim didn't come into you know he couldn't make his workout because he's sick and which is it's alarming. weird." Yeah, yeah. Cause I'm, oh shit! So and he's old, you know, and he's yeah. older. So I'm like, "Oh shit!" Let me call him. I call him up. He's like, "Hey, what's up, buddy?" I'm like, "Oh fuck." <laughs> You're not a bad. <laughs> yeah, he's like, well, I think I might take an extra day off, but yeah, I was pretty crummy on Thursday, and you know, this is like three days later, and now he's okay. And I'm like, you know, it it makes such a tremendous difference, and the exercises that make the biggest difference on strength uh, are the deadlift, the barbell squat, overhead presses, rows, bench press. These fun- functional, foundational movements they build the most muscle and they give you the most strength. And you also have to think about what makes your physical performance functional in the first place? Well, it needs to translate into everyday life. What does everyday modern life look like? Well, you got to be able to walk. You got to be able to pick things up, walk upstairs, balance a little bit, twist to grab something. 
And so you don't need to be super crazy acrobatic circus-like with your exercises to make you functional. Those are really only functional for people who do those types of activities. So if you if your lifestyle involves lots of crazy balancing and all these other things, well, yeah, you might want to do more of that because that's going to make you more functional. If you're a baseball player, there's going to be more specific movements to make you more functional as a baseball player. But if you're the average person, like nothing's more functional than the, squatting. You can't. You but can't that get being around it. that being said, I think it's important when we say that it doesn't mean okay, you have this. 80 year old who can't squat their form is breaking down and then you hear on mind pump that we keep saying they yeah. need to squat and so you just it keep load no. them up no yeah. yeah it doesn't mean you load them up it doesn't mean you force them right. to squat it means you you've got to learn and this is again back to it's you know mechanics my my plug here is that this is why we created prime and prime pro was prime has the assessment you can it has a squat assessment on there it has a hinge assessment in there it has a rotational assessment in there and then where they break down it helps guide you through what you should be, what type of movements you should do to help fix that dysfunction. Dude. Now that's what you, you should be putting a lot of energy on that, and then you go over and you squat. Then you go put some more energy in that. Then you go back and you squat. Then you put exactly, and, and you pay attention to how it starts to improve their mechanics, and you help them make that connection of this is why you're not able to squat, or this is why your low back bothers you, this is why your knees bother you when you actually squat. It's not the squat. The exercise it's your body. Doing, yeah, it's your body. Your body is broken mechanically, mm -hmm. and notice how much better you felt after we did these prime movements, and then yeah. I took Dude, you to squat. You never... your body breaks in tension, and you know, yeah. where you lose communication. These are all important things. And keep in mind, if you have somebody in advanced age, you may never get them to be able to do a, a full barbell squat. Like you may never get to that point. I had clients like that too. Right, right. I've had clients. Like yeah, that. who yeah. are in their late in their eighties who were deconditioned. Yeah, right. just and we trained for three years. Yeah, it. we trained three yeah. years. Never got be. We're never able to do a barbell squat, but we continued to work towards the the the, the goal of being able to do that, which right. meant tremendous improvement. I tell you something right now. Uh, let me ask you guys a question. How much does it cost for a correctional exercise certification from like a reputable? Company like uh, seven hundred to a thousand yeah. plus dollars easily, right? Yeah, yeah it's up if there you're now. a trainer, if you're a trainer and you don't own Prime and Prime Pro, you are missing out. In fact, I would say it will save you a shit ton of money over a correctional exercise certification, and you're going to get a lot of of applicable movements and stuff that you can give to your client that I know I went through these certs. They don't necessarily give you these well, kinds of, course, of things. Well, of course, it's it's all the information the three of us plus Dr. Brink collectively have distilled in the most practical way that we could deliver it. That's the idea. With we, assessments involved. Right, the idea was, okay, let's take all this education, information, experience between the four of us and how do we distill that for the average person that they can actually be able to take that and apply it to their own Here's, body or if you're a trainer, how do you take that information and apply it to a client? I have a question for Doug because I know Doug is more privy on the whole tax thing. Um, if you're a trainer... Yes, you could write that off. Well, I was going to say, if yeah. you're a trainer, you can write off certifications, right? Absolutely. Okay. It's part now, of your business. Now... What if you are a trainer and you buy, you buy materials? You buy like maps programs yes. to, to help you, you with your clients. I guarantee, I guarantee you can. Yeah. Anything you're using for your business, you can use as a write off. Oh, there you fucking go. I'm not a CPA, so I will say, you know, as a disclaimer, I'm not a CPA, so ask your CPA. <laughs> But I will say yes, you can. Yeah, because I feel like if you buy, especially correctional, I've been programs, doing it for I've been doing it for years. If I I would even buy other people's programs and write that off because it's still it's because you're learning how to yeah do exactly that. it's educational purposes towards your towards your business. I mean you, yeah no you can definitely write well there that. you go. Next up is Michael Hargood. How to deadlift for beginners? I feel like there's a theme today. Yeah, whoa, yeah, we're, we're such heading, a simple this is like. Yeah, this is like an old school topic. Such a simple topic, but it's important because uh, I don't think we have addressed this in a long time. No, right? I, don't, I don't think we have. No. I, so here's how I used to progress people to be able to uh, do a deadlift. Now, a deadlift was easier for me typically to teach hmm. than a full squat. Uh, I, I, I just feel like it's it, they're both hard to teach, but yeah. I found that a deadlift, I could progress people to a decent type of a deadlift faster than a squat because I feel like there was less involved. And oh, that, really? Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I disagree. Yeah, I actually had a harder time like communicating for you know my, my career in the beginning, like hip hinging and like getting people to really understand right. how to do that properly and not squat their way down. So mm -hmm. that was like something I had to kind of um, really figure out how to articulate that better and how to translate that to the client. And um, yeah, that was a challenge, man. Like, uh, starting from scratch and there's a lot of factors involved in the deadlift that, yeah. uh, are nuanced. One, one thing I used to do was I would start people with a very high 
um, deadlift. So if I had a rack, what I would do is I'd take a barbell and it would, or I'd start with a stick. So if I had clients who were just weak, right, or they didn't have, if I wasn't comfortable even with a really, really high deadlift with them bending over and picking something up, I would just use a broomstick. Yeah. And what I would do is I'd set it on a rack so that it's literally many times above their knees. So they're not even, they're not even, they're not even close to doing a full deadlift. They're starting at their knees, just teaching them how to pivot at the hips while maintaining stability in their core. So their low back is in that natural arch position, not overarched and not obviously in a, in a rounded position, nice, tall chest, grab the stick, brace your core, pause, wait for my cue mm. and slowly drive through the floor with your legs and stand up nice and tall. And I would cue and cue and cue. Right. And once I felt comfortable with that, I didn't add weight. I would lower the bar down a little bit and then we would practice from there until we got to the point where they were deadlifting low enough to then what I would do is I wouldn't add weight to the bar. I would go and transition to a sumo uh, deadlift with a kettlebell or something because mm. it's just an easier position. Yeah, or, I would actually start with the stick, kind of similar, but I'd start with the stick actually up their spine. And That's and, what I would do too. Yeah, and then I would get them to understand how to brace and actually That's pull back, you know. Um, and then like I would use the wall to see, like I would have them keep their knees neutral and then have them pull their hips back so they could try to get their, their glutes to the wall to even understand like what hip hinging like, so is I supposed a, to feel like. That's a great I have a technique to help that. Yours is closer to mine. So I break it all the way, all the way down first to a, uh, prone floor bridge first. Mm. So they under, so they can so they can have the assistance of gravity. They're laying on the floor. They have feedback, and they can understand that keeping the back rigid while also hinging at the hips. Just getting that communication first, and then from there, I'll pick them up. I'll do something similar where you're saying, Justin, is I'll put the stick on the three points on their back so they know how to keep that rigid, mm -hmm. and then I'll take a really light band around their waist. And I'll, we'll just do like a stick or a or the barbell and deadlift, and I want so the band is pulling their hips oh, right. back. Yeah, I've seen people do that. That's right, a good one, yeah. and so and then and so I'll, it's like a little assistance. To yes, pull the exactly. So I'll I'll cue by kind of hitting them right in the mm -hmm. in the hips and say you know hip slide back. It keep, teaches keep that these, process. Keep and these three points. Yeah. yeah, and so it te and and the band's assisting the pulling back, so it feels more natural. That's great. Yeah, that is a good one. And so should that do a YouTube on that. We should do a YouTube That'd on be that. A Doug. Great one. Do a I because I, I, I don't think I've taught how to deadlift for beginners. That would be a great. Yeah. No. Because that, I could visually see that, and I've seen people actually coach that, and I think it's very helpful. Because like that whole process in the beginning, I th I think that people see and they perceive, uh, you know, somebody actually performing the exercise, but they don't really know what they look like Dude, as they're performing. Bro, it, mechanically, so. uh, I think that's why. I mean, they're, they're both close, right? Squat and deadlifting is for sure. I mean, we could sit here and argue all day which one's harder, but they both are <clears throat> very very challenging. It's Dead, a skill. Deadlifting, I think it, deadlifting to me because it's mostly all posterior chain you know what i'm saying it's very very little anterior driven squats get a little bit more anterior so i feel like people are a little more comfortable posterior being the muscles of the back of your right, body yeah. anterior right. being the Everything muscles of the front. behind you yeah, yeah we're, we're so disconnected back there that i feel like it's just so foreign to which people. what came yeah. more naturally to you guys when you first start working out squats well, or deadlifts well deadlifts came naturally to me. me too yeah Oh really? Yeah, yeah I, dead, I, deadlifts took a lot of work for dude, me. Dude, the first time I picked up a bar, I think I was but able to you, deadlift three hundred so pounds. So you, you want to know why uh, that was? What are what I unpacking that? Why why did I have an easier time with deadlifts than squatting when I was first learning? Because both of them are arguably very challenging. Is the position of my hips? Because I already have an excessive mm -hmm. anterior pelvic tilt, so it mm -hmm. kind of helped me keep that rigid back when I would when I'd slide the hips back. And it actually, when I slide back into a deadlift, and because I already have the hips in that in, in excessive kind of lower mm -hmm. doses going. It kind of sets me back into this perfect position. I think that's why I was really good at pulling right out the gates. Well, I think with sports in particular, like I know being in certain positions, I was always up on my toes and ready to react left to right. You know, that position that you're you're supposed to be somewhat squatted and responsive. So mm -hmm. either I'm playing baseball, I'm playing, uh, you know, basketball, I'm playing football. Like I'm, I was always up on the, the forefoot. Right. And so, you know, everything's anterior driven. So I would just drop right in and yeah, like, like really activated my posterior chain was something I had to work at. I, yeah, deadlifts for me were the first time I ever deadlifted, I was, um, probably 16. So I started working out at 14, 16. It was the first time I deadlifted and there were power lifters that showed me how to, how to pull. And I pulled three three plates. It was my it was it was very natural. I just got into it hmm. and just lifted it up. And it's always been a very natural movement for me. Squats, 
Not so much. Yeah. Not at I, all. I, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I re- Squats I, took me forever. I, I still vivid, have to work on it. I vividly remember deadlifting, and by the second or third session I was deadlifting, I had already kind of made the connect the, the connection and was ramping my weight up. I went from like 135 and like trying to figure the form down to ramping up to like three plates really, really fast where squats, oh my God, to get to three. It's, I spent half my life getting to three plates. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was just broken mechanically for my squats. It's just, it's, yeah. I think it has a lot to do with your posture already. It does. Really- it, it does. And there, there was a point where I, I got was good at front squats, but back squats were always more more difficult for me, which is fucking weird, right? It's always the other way around. Front squats are so hard. Yeah. Typically. Well, they're hard because it's hard to balance up there, but it's actually, I mean, I think we've all found this, right? I mean, I teach a goblet squat or a front squat sometimes when someone's really struggling with a barbell back yeah, squat yeah. because it forces you upright. Like if you're a, if you're a heavy chest falling forward mm-hmm. all the time. So, but this would be a really, not, listening to everybody's tips because everybody's tips are fucking solid. You know, those are those are all money tips, mm-hmm. and I've, I think we've all probably tried or played around with a lot of them. That'll be a good video. Yep. Next up, Misfit and Nerdy. <laughs> Misfit and Nerdy. Yeah. yeah. She's in our forums. Yeah, yeah. What exactly do you mean when you talk about priming your central nervous system? Trying to understand exactly how MAPS Prime works. So Ooh. I'm going to tell you a little story uh, about... Uh, Peep charlatans in the in the mall that connects to this. So <laughs> this is so, a magnet. Oh, people. dude. So I uh, years ago. Do you guys remember when uh, it was all popular in baseball for the people to wear those yes, stupid the copper the copper rings? The, yes, it, it, it was like this makes you pitch fast or whatever. So there was a one of those kiosks in the mall where this guy was selling these magnetic bracelets and necklaces, and apparently they improve your performance. And so he stops me. He's like, "Hey, man." You should, and of course, I'm in fitness and stuff, so I'm like, oh, this is gonna be great. And he's like, hey, man, check this out. This is like increases your performance. This is like what the guys in the you know MLB are wearing. This and that. And I'm like, oh, really? I'm like, how does it work? And he tries to give me this bullshit pitch about the what it's made out of is this specially processed metal that yeah, <laughs> yeah. whatever yeah. you know lines up with the the sun and the quasars and whatever. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he goes, no, no, check this out. Check out this test. It's really cool. So he says, stand on one foot, balance. And put one arm out. So I stand on one foot and I extend one arm. And then he pushes on my arm and I kind of tip over. And he says, okay, now put this. Br-. Then he puts the bracelet on me real quick. And then he says, now stand on one leg and do that again. So then I stand on it again and he tries to push my arm down and I have much better balance. So at the time, I don't Miracle. Know, at the time, I, was, I don't remember who I was with. And they were, I forgot who it was, I was one of my cousins. And they're like, oh shit, that's crazy. Like, <laughs> how does that fucking work, dude? Partly and I'm trick. like, yeah. And I'm like, well, let me ask you a question. If I had you balance walk across a balance beam and do one practice run and then try it again. Which one do you think would be better? And he's like, uh, the, well, the second one. I'm like, well, why do you think you got better the second time? Oh, well, I don't, I'm like, cause your central nervous system is adapting. You're calling upon it to fire muscles and work in a particular way to give you better balance, which is why I can literally improve someone's balance immediately. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be permanent, but for sure, practice your balance, and within five minutes, you're going to balance better than the <laughs> you know, first time. You know what that reminds me of? Is right. the uh, what were the name of those guys from LA that when we went down, they stick their finger in my mouth? Oh, uh, the human garage. Yes, that wasn't his finger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We videoed, bro. That was like one of those things where he kept go. We kept going back to the table, and then he would do something that hurt me, and then yeah. we get up and walk. Look how much better you're walking. It's like you know what that reminds me. It's like when someone's like, "Oh man, my shoulder really hurts." And then you punch him in the face, and you're like, "Is this still? <laughs> is your shoulder still, still feeling your shoulder? Yeah, your shoulder uh, oh, yeah. still hurt?" Yeah. <laughs> Like, no, no like, I have a no, black dude. eye. No, no so your, your central nervous system is adapting, and that's why, same reason why if you stretch, you can gain, you know, several inches yeah. of range of motion. Immediately. Immediately. Like, I could take someone, I could test their hamstring out, and then I could stretch them for 30 minutes, and they'll be way more flexible in me instantly. Right. Now, again, it doesn't mean it's permanent. But what I'm doing is I'm changing. Well, that's why adding tension, I mean, you're just heightening. Like you're you're getting the central nervous system more responsive. It's it's right. it's communicating at a louder um, frequency. Right. So. so so for misfit and nerdy, the central nervous system is what controls your muscles. It's the operating system. It is what determines how much your muscles are allowed to extend and stretch, how hard they can contract, um, how easily, how much they can relax. And how all of the muscles can communicate with the, or how all of the muscles, I should say, fire and what pattern they fire and how hard they fire. And there's a lot more that goes into it. It's much more complex than that, but that's kind of a general easy to understand kind uh, of breakdown. Your, your central nerve, your, your speaker and amplifier analogy, I think, is one of the best analogies to explain the CNS. I think that's. 
Yeah, so the CNS is the, the, the amplifier and the muscles are speakers. So the amp is what puts out the power and causes the, the, the sound to come out of the speaker. So what you're doing before you work out can encourage more optimal central nervous system operating or firing. So if I'm going to do a bench press and I prime my personal body, by the way, how you prime your body is quite individual because what one person may need, another person, yeah. it might be the opposite of what the other person needs. So when I prime my body based on my own recruitment patterns, my own uh, you know, you know, structural deviations or recruitment pattern issues or whatever, when I when I do that to myself and I do it right, now my body's gonna fire more optimally when I do these big you know, important exercises like squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, or whatever. And because I'm firing better, my results are going to be better, both because <clears throat> I'm able to activate more muscle fibers and also because I'm encouraging good recruitment patterns the entire time. So I'm reducing my risk of injury um, and better form just equals better uh, results all the way around. Another anyway. way, to, another way to look at it is like um, you guys ever had a your arm fall asleep when you when you wake up and your your arm's completely dead and it's yes. fall asleep because you've had and it then still. You do the stranger, right? Well, so <laughs> oh, yes. imagine imagine if you were to wake up and you and you feel. And we've all probably had too. this happen. I think everybody's had their arm fall asleep before, right? So if you wake up and you have a baseball right this right at the right next to your bed and you wake up and your arm falls asleep and you grab the baseball and the goal is to throw it throw it as accurately as possible. And you did it with no time in between. You get up from a sleepy arm. You, everyone knows what that would look You're like. You're not right? going to be able to grab the yeah, ball. Yeah, I, I can, you noodle can, arm. Right, you can't even use your arm for a few seconds until your body, until that CNS starts to get reconnected back over there. Now, think if you sat up and you sit there and you articulate your fingers and you get them moving, so like that, give it about 30 seconds to a minute, two minutes, and then you grab the ball and you throw it. Which one's going to be way more accurate, right? Yeah. Think of it the same way as your body is it's kind of when we when we're not firing muscles properly, in a sense it kind of goes to sleep. And by you priming it properly, you're getting those muscles, you're articulating those muscles, you're getting them to fire right, and then think of how much better you're gonna have your workout. Well, I think too, yeah, like everybody kind of knows when they like bench press, for instance, like I've gone through a process back in the day where I, I would take like at least three or four sets before I knew like, okay, I'm ready and I'm, I'm warm to now start adding like a substantial amount right. of load. Um, That's a form of priming. It's a form of priming, but it's not as specific. So right. there's a way to make that process even more specific. Say It's like, a rudimentary way of priming, right? Right. So say I just needed to retract my shoulders and depress them more uh, to stabilize my shoulder joint in that lift. Well, I could prime that specifically so much more effectively going in to now bench pressing where that's going to be something okay wow i'm ready you right. know i'm responsive that's well, right I, I think that only works too when you're somebody who really understands mechanics well because what you're doing when you're doing that for sets Good one point. two and three is each set you're getting better and better into your form you're and you're in the groove of you're, it, yeah. right you're getting in the groove of it and you know what the right groove feels like yeah where if you're the average jane or joe and you, you don't, don't know what that feels yeah, like. can, you don't can you priming don't, be done improperly absolutely yes. you can prime your body in a way that makes it less this is where injury happens yes how many times has somebody done a bench press that they pro they've done a hundred times before but this time they fucked their shoulder up well that's because their body wasn't prime properly. here's the difference between prime and prime pro by the way prime is what we're talking about prime pro is correctional exercise to per, to help treat injury it's addressing each pain. individual joint. Yeah, this is prime is literally teaching you how to prime your workouts. How big of a difference does this make? A massive fucking difference. A, I remember as a personal trainer putting this together and training my clients in this particular way, where I'd see them, I'd prime them, boom, we do a squat or a deadlift or whatever. Form was good, everything was firing better, and they the progress was tr was just so much better as a result. It of expedites it. the process. This is why. When I wrote Maps Anabolic, which I which I think I created five years ago, maybe maybe longer. More than that. Yeah, six years ago. When I created Maps Anabolic, phase one of Maps Anabolic starts with one or two sets of box squats before you go into heavy barbell squats. Uh -huh. Because I knew that, generally speaking, that's going to prime more people better to do a box squat first and then to do regular squats so they can teach their hips or get their hips to prime and fire better. Now, it's not very individualized. Taking it a million steps further, Maps Prime, we were able to put in, indiv like you know, a compass test that individualizes priming for each individual person, which was a big challenge. I'm gonna be honest with you. Yeah. Like teaching how to prime for lifts 
is so dependent on the individual that we thought it would be impossible to write a program. It was was our hardest program we did. For sure. To date, for sure. For sure. 100% took the most to get that that program out. No, I I think that not only is is priming huge and learning how to do it for you personally, but that that compounds as you get older. Mm-hmm. Like the, 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 because I think as a young, if you're listening and you're like 17 to 25 and in your head, you're going like, oh, I got no injuries. My workouts are good. Like, I just want to know the newest pre-workout or give me the newest fucking program you designed. Like, that's all they want to hear. It's like, but you don't realize how important this is now because it's your body's not talking to you yet. It's not forcing you to make it a priority. It will eventually. And it's, and if you can start to put in a practice now early on, you'll have to put less time into it, right? Instead of having to prime, like if I have a 80 year old client who's never taken care of their posture, their mechanics form, the whole hour could end up being kind of like priming it and trying just to get them to walk properly or just get them to be able to squat down properly. The whole fucking session is a prime. Mm-hmm. And so that's an example of how it compounds. Now, if you're someone who's 25, it might be there's a couple moves that you do that really makes a difference that makes you bench better or squat better that you implement now because it gets you into better alignment that you start doing and you make a habit before you train every time. And it will never become a problem. It'll be something that you actually stay stay on top of. But eventually, if you don't address this, because none of us are in this perfect form right we're not in this like to to squat or deadlift all day long we're constantly twisting moving rounding sitting slouching we're 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 creating all these bad recruitment patterns and then we're going in the gym and then we're expecting ourselves to all of a sudden whoop we go into a perfect form like no it's not going to happen that way so that's priming is extremely important next question is from mike narducci what is the best way to train grip strength for all around activities or lifts is there any merit to the various grip training devices geared toward rock climbers and OCR athletes? It's another person that likes to do activities like you. Yes. <laughs> so many activities. That's so funny. Yeah. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. It's a, yeah. Hey, it's yeah. Mike and Narducci. Hey, so what are my people? Yeah. So uh, before we get into, well, first off with grip strength, you know, it wasn't that long ago where a man's strength was measured by his grip. For a long time, it was all about your grip. And we all know the old, you know, adage, you know, a firm handshake. Right? Oh, yeah. That handshake was yeah. always the, you know, you get the old guy that's so just kill you. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you, and, and you're like, dude, really? And, and this is, be, and there's some, <laughs> is that necessary? crushing yeah. me. There's some truth as to why men were measured by their grip strength or why that was such an important thing. Your grip, your hands, or what connect you, literally what connect you to the world. So, Regardless of how strong your back and your chest and your shoulders and your legs are, if you can't hold on to things- It'll always be your limiting factor. You're done. You're yeah, fucked. Right, so yeah. strong hands are extremely functional per, for life and definitely for many, many types of sports. On that point alone, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's so important to point out is that that's why I think the feet are too. Like The feet and the hands, arguably, and I think that's something I didn't think about as an early trainer, so that's why I wanted to stop you and make that point. Like. I, my thought process is totally different now. Sure, like that, sure. now I would like look at those things. Like, man, if I have which it's hands, your first point of contact, right? Hands, we use them so much, so we don't see it see it as much, right? Because yeah. we everybody has like decently strong hands. Well, at least they're not like crazily dysfunctional, like, like everybody's feet are. Yeah, like everybody's feet are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But those two areas are yeah. that important. So, so hand strength and grip strength is extremely important. Also, we know that humans are primates, so we did. Although our hands evolved to be able to articulate our joints and to mani- you know manipulate small things and to throw things really well. We also are an- we have ancestors that were climbing and, and swinging in trees, which means the potential for tremendous grip strength is actually quite high and it should not be your limiting factor. It shouldn't be what limits you from doing heavy lifts and heavy pulls. In fact, your grip should be able to keep up with your body if you allow it to train, if you yeah. train it with your body. Well, in fact, that's usually that's my own personal measure of like when to progress is is I have to make sure my grip can um, you know, keep up with that weight. You know, otherwise I feel like I haven't earned that weight yet. That's right. So, here's the thing with with strength. There's uh there's the strength that's concentric. So that's the ability to shorten a muscle. So that would be like squeezing something. Like my hands are literally going from open to closed. Then there's the isometric strength, which is just holding a contracted position. And then there's the eccentric strength, which is the ability to go from you know, closed to slowly opening with weight. We don't need to worry about that. Let's focus on the other two first. 
the ability to close your hand and then the ability to hold a closed hand, both of which are important to train, both of them which communicate with each other and there's definitely carryover, but both are quite unique in the sense that you could have somebody who's extremely strong at squeezing and closing their hand, but might not have the isometric strength of holding a grip like somebody who, let's say, is maybe a jiu-jitsu fighter mm. or a rock climber, for example, because it's a very unique type of strength. Now, the arguably the type of grip strength that's more important is the ability to hold, to hold a grip, because I think functionally speaking, if you think of all the things you use your hands with, very there's definitely moments where you need to like actually move and squeeze your hand. Like if you're operating like heavy scissors or pliers and stuff like that, like I get that, but more often than not, it's just being able to hold on to something without letting go. That's important. So you, you do want to train both of those things and you do want to treat it. If grip strength is a priority, like a separate body part. So if I'm doing my workout and uh, you know, I'm let's say I'm doing a full body workout or even if I'm doing biceps or whatever, Make sure you dedicate some time to working on your grip, but start slow because if you haven't worked directly on your grip, yeah, it's really easy to overdo. Oh, yeah, really easy. Yeah, really, and, it's, and it sucks because when you overdo working on your, your hands, you get that, uh, what is that, tennis elbow, oh, yeah, you right. know, where you get it at the points that of your elbows. Right up there, that yeah. Tools. yeah. I, I, would, I would do uh, rice buckets and farmer walks. I was going to say, farmer walks all day. Yeah, farmer walks and then rice buckets. The rice buckets I like because of what Sal made a great point mm -hmm. on it is that you kind of get everything there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that'll kind of help keep so it. So how do you use a rice bucket? Cause people so are like, you just like a, you know, like a, well, five gallons overkill, but you don't need a whole five gallon. You get like a big, one of those big bags of rice from Costco pour it in a nice bag that's deep enough to where your hands can sink all the way in and you just you move your hands around for time so you dip you know? them in you put them in the, in the yeah, sand you put them in yeah you or put you can use in, sand too I yeah think. sand sand would work yeah sand or rice um you just, and you're you're moving them around you're opening you're closing you're stretching the fingers out you're just constantly doing that and you do it for time and if you like you said you've never done it before you know don't start with five minutes of it you won't even be able to make that okay. but you know get in there exercise it for a little while then when you start it starts to really burn probably rest mm -hmm. for a few 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 seconds or a minute go back at it again do a couple rounds of that progress that way that'll be that'll keep dude if you're an ocr racer your grip is so important oh, yeah. I, every so far everyone i've seen i can like that's the limiting factor on all of them right yeah is there an ability yeah, to hold on to most shit? people can yeah they can endure and they can go through that process like but yeah the grip strength is that's that's usually like where you see people just like oh it, don't it forget kills them. don't forget there's a genetic component too like people don't i mean there, there's some like when you look at someone like ben greenfield like he was meant to have maybe or that motherfucker's been climbing shit forever, forever dude yeah. well yeah no I, but i think I mean, he's long and lanky too, physically but, changed yeah his hands and feet. dude i had i'll tell you what how many people do you how many men do you know that have worked construction their whole life right yeah, yeah. quite a few do all of them not have like ridiculous oh, hands? Yeah, ridiculous yeah, grips. Yeah. Every yeah. single one. My dad's hands are like bricks. Yeah. He's been working with his hands since he was nine years old. Until this day when I grab, and he doesn't lift weights or he's retired now. When I grab his hand, I know that if he wanted to, he could break one of my fingers because yeah. his hands have just thickened and strengthened as a result of all these different, you know, of working with his hands for so long. So, so here's one of my favorite movements. It's a super, super easy one. You take a piece of paper. It used to be a newspaper, but good luck trying to find one of those nowadays. But get a big piece of paper and crumple it from the corner with one hand and slowly bring the paper in and try to crumple the whole thing into a big ball and squeeze it and then grow and then get another one. So you're starting from the corner. This is an old school strongman. Wow, I've never done that. It's an old school strongman exercise where you start from the corner and you squeeze, squeeze, squeeze until you get the entire yeah. piece of paper. It's funny. The only it. thing uh, you guys remember the old rope in, in. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember that. That was like the only version of grip training I did back in the day. But I remember that was like Arnold or somebody was doing that, and so I would do that. Another one I used to do is, and I used to use my my <laughs> jujitsu gi for this, but you can use two towels. Is you take two towels and you hang them over a pull-up bar and then grab yeah. the towels yeah. and then hang or do pull-ups like that. And it's a very different uh, stress oh, yeah. on your grip to hold those things. So you can either hold them by by wrapping them by by grabbing them like a, almost like a tube. So you grab the whole towel like a tube or you can grab them if you're a jiu-jitsu or judo guy like a gi where they roll it, where they go inside oh, yeah. your fingers a little bit and then do pull-ups and Dude, changing boy, the grip strengthen. on any yeah. in any level is going to help, you know, gain strength in that direction. Right. Some something I've been told many many times by the way from friends of mine that were women and, and, and girls and stuff is that 
that they find hands and in forearms very attractive. Like that's a that's a thing apparently. So if you're a guy, you get those Popeye arms. There's some motivation right there to strengthen yeah. your yeah. Not, yeah. not just your right hand either. Yeah. Do the other no, one. You got to balance it out. That's right. Listen, go to your uh, app store and get the Mind Pump Media app. It's free. On that app, you can search specific topics that'll go through all of our 700 plus episodes. Find when we talked about those topics, bring those episodes up for you, and listen to our brilliant advice on those specific topics. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.